Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to this uh, health professional and industry briefing on the review of the PSA uh, test guidelines. It's terrific uh, to have you join us. Um, Jeff Dunn is my name. It's my pleasure to lead us through the process this morning, and it's also my pleasure to uh, chair the actual uh, guideline review process. With me this morning is an esteemed panel uh, who individually will contribute uh, to our understanding of the guidelines review um, and at the same time be available to answer questions as we get to the end of that. Um, so joining me very briefly, uh, clinical professor Peter Heathcote, an eminent urologist, past president of USANS, uh, who is also uh, serving as the co-chair of the review process. Associate Professor David Smith uh, from the Daffodil Centre, who actually runs the engine room for the review process, the scientific and technical arm of our endeavour. Also today, we have Professor Suzanne Chambers, AO, uh, a world-class and renowned clinical and health psychologist with great experience uh, in prostate cancer. He'll talk to us about aspects of the review process important to men and their families uh, and of course uh, Will McDonald um, based in Adelaide uh, a news anchor man and someone who has a very personal experience uh, with prostate cancer himself and collectively today uh, we're hoping to provide you uh, with a briefing on the review uh, and where that is taking us um, by way of housekeeping, a, a, a couple of things. Uh, we intend to run through the presentations and, and then take questions at the end. If at any time you have questions, please do submit them uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our very best to get to each and every one of them uh, once we finish the formal presentation. So, so please do that. And, and of course, at the end of the session, I, I will be talking with you about how you can gather further information uh, from our info packs and from our websites. Uh, the task today is to provide a briefing on the review of the 2016 uh, practice guidelines for PSA testing. Um, a review of these guidelines has been an adv advocacy target for the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia for some time. And I'm delighted to, to say that the Commonwealth have funded uh, this review because they too see the need uh, and we have it registered with the NH and MRC ultimately to gain approval uh, from that organisation for the new guidelines, uh, just as they did approve the previous one. As you could imagine, you know, the requirements from a governance and process point of view to satisfy both the Commonwealth and the NH and MRC uh, are both rigorous and substantive. And uh, David Smith will talk a little bit more about those when we get to that stage of the presentation. Uh, the current guidelines actually provide, excuse me, support and advice for men uh, on informed consent uh, for PSA testing. Um, these guidelines and support are based on risk factors around age uh, and, you know, family history uh, and those types of things. Now, the guidelines also currently provide further information about, you know, next steps and management of early disease. Uh, these guidelines in 2016 were based on 21 individual recommendations and the task of this review is to examine each and every one of those uh, recommendations um, uh, but in addition to examine additional information additional evidence which has come to light since that review uh, was conducted and make recommendations to the commonwealth uh, on approval from the NH and MRC about what the new set of guidelines uh, should be offering men and their families out there. There have been some, you know, with the existing guidelines, some concerns about awareness. We know that 70% of Australians actually don't know what the current guidelines say. Um, the current guidelines have not necessarily been uniformly applied. And certainly since 2016, there have been some significant increases, some significant advances uh, in, you know, in research and in technology, as well as changes in clinical practice, which all need to be factored into this review process. So our task today is to actually provide a briefing for you uh, to make sure that we uh, make, uh, 
bring you in as colleagues and those interested in this process and assure you uh, that this work is going to be of, of the sort of top level in terms of evidence and process and rigor. We are hoping this is a transformative process in relation to prostate cancer and how it's sort of uh, detected early and managed in this country. And importantly, that we use this as an opportunity to raise awareness about the disease, you know, which is now, of course, the most commonly diagnosed cancer in this country. So without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce clinical professor Peter Heathcote, uh, an eminent urologist, a practicing urologist, past president of USANS, to talk with us a bit more about why this review is necessary um, and what it will mean. Take it away, Peter. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, greetings, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. And um, certainly a shout out to all of the uh, people who are involved in the, the care of and support of uh, men and their families with prostate cancer. So uh, I, in the short time I've got, I'm going to talk about, do we really need an update? Uh, is it important? Has anything changed? And I also just want to touch on the lessons learned from the 2016 guidelines. What can we do better? What we, did we do well back then? Um, and what's the way forward? So do we need a review? Uh, has anything changed since the 2016 review? Remembering that the um, literature to the 2016 review is based on was at the most recent literature was around 2014. So the obvious answer is uh, it's almost 10 years of the literature's changed. Well, what has changed? I think the biggest thing in my practice that I've seen change is the move away from PSA as thinking of it as a diagnostic test as to thinking of it as part of a suite of information uh, where we're going to uh, risk stratify men and then manage them appropriately uh, and harm minimization being being the overarching theme as we do that. So the two phrases that are, you're going to hear a lot of is is risk stratification, harm minimization. If you take nothing else away from my talk, uh, turn off now if you like, because that's all I want to say. So uh, as I said, PSA test is not a diagnostic test. It doesn't say you've got cancer. What it says is, oh, this is a group of men who may benefit from further interrogation. No more, no less. And things really have changed. So uh, let's, let's look at some of the things that have changed since uh, the 2016 guidelines. The PSA data itself has matured enormously. If we look at the, Euro, the the large European studies now, um, the number the number needed to screen to save a life for prostate cancer has plummeted from two thousand to three hundred and eighty five over the last ten years or so. The number needed to diagnose is now only eleven, and of those eleven diagnosed, approximately only half are treated. So. If we had a new treatment that came out today in 2023 that said you only need to treat five men to save one life, it would be headline news in the Sydney Morning Herald, the Melbourne Age, everywhere else in Australia. So I don't want to bring my biases because I'm, I'm part of this process, but gee, the PSA data is looking pretty strong that it does save lives. But there are problems, of course, and we'll talk about that in a minute, harm minimisation. What else has changed? MRI. That's been a big game changer. And Australia's led the way with that. Since 2018, it's been on the MBS, supported by the federal government. Uh, and there's no doubt that the combination of PSA with MRI and neurologic review has decreased the number of unnecessary biopsies and increased the accuracy of the actual biopsies that are occurring. So again, it's about risk stratification with PSA and MRI. And then we move on to the biopsies. What are the risks of biopsies? Everyone has uh, rightly talked about the risks of infection with uh, conventional transrectal biopsies. And they've talked about the inaccuracy of the biopsies. Well, let me tell you um, that uh, from 2015 to 2019, um, we've 
essentially move from transrectal to transperineal biopsies in urologic practice in Australia. Well, uh, over 70% of men now are uh, diagnosed by uh, transperineal biopsy. That's a 2019 figure from the Prostate Cancer Outcomes Registry. Um, and there's, in my personal practice, it's 99.9%. And any of uh, my colleagues are all up there. With, you know, transrectal is only really used uh, if you don't have access to transperineal. And that's, that's really unusual. So that's been a major change. The next dramatic change has been active surveillance. And that's, again, now moving into the harm minimisation. We're not over-treating men with low-risk disease. And again, I can tell you that using the latest uh, prostate cancer outcomes registry data, 80% um, of men with low-risk disease are now treated with active surveillance in Australia. That's a world-leading figure. And that's that's a figure from a year or so ago. But I can tell you, if, if I look at my personal prostate outcomes data looking at the general uh, population I'm compared against, it's probably around 90, 94% of men are being treated with active surveillance. David Smith may know more up-to-date figures. He still sits on the steering committee. I don't sit on the steering committee for PCOR anymore, but you may have more updated figures, David. But anyway, what I'm saying is Australian urologists are adopting active surveillance big time. We've adopted transperineal biopsies. We've adopted MRIs. This is all about risk stratification, harm, minimization. A new kit on the block is PET scanning. The data on that is still maturing, but it looks like it's going to be another way of avoiding, un, in this setting, of avoiding unnecessary biopsies. So if a man has an elevated PSA, but the MRI is normal, the PSA density is low, free and total ratio density is low. If you want to avoid a biopsy, do a PSMA PET. If that's low, the likelihood of significant cancer then is 1% or 2%. So again, we're avoiding unnecessary biopsies. We're avoiding PSA anxiety. So yes, a lot has changed. Very quickly, Jeff, I can see you giving me the wind up here. Um, what did we learn from 2016? Uh, the two big lessons I personally learned from 2016 is that um, there was a lot of ang ambiguity about the recommendations. Now, I think, to be fair, I think that's a reflection of what the literature was saying at the time. Again, this is a bias, perhaps, but I think the literature is much clearer now. It's much more directive. And I'm hoping that out of these this guidelines review, we can be a lot more directive um, in our recommendations, time will tell. That's up to David and his crew to, to find that literature and confirm it. But the other big, the big lesson we've learned is we have to educate the general public more and we have to generate, educate general practitioners and our colleagues more. And that's a major uh, effort being put up by PCFA to whom I'm eternally grateful for their efforts um, in this space. I won't say any more, but I'm really happy to answer questions. So things have changed. We're doing a lot better. Remember, risk stratification, harm minimisation. Let's educate the public and GPs. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, look, thank you, Peter. We appreciate that, as always. And you bringing your experience and expertise to the table, uh, you know, provides great comfort to those of us who are working with you on the review. So, look, thank you for that. Uh, what, what we'll now do, and a, a reminder to everyone out there, if you've got questions, put them in the Q&A box uh, and then we'll address them when we get to uh, the end of our session this morning. Uh, what we'll now do is flick to, to David. So I've heard about why the review is necessary. David's going to talk to us about how we're going to conduct this and and, and why it is, in, you know, if you've got this question, why does it take so long? Because our, our intention is to report back to government early 2025. Uh, so, David, why don't you run? Why, why don't you run our participants uh, through the how of this review? Thanks, Jeff. That will be my pleasure. My name is David Smith. I'm um, an epidemiologist uh, with a, a, a big interest in prostate cancer, and I'm with the the, the Daffodil Centre, which is a flagship centre that has been established between Cancer Council New South Wales and the um, University of Sydney. And um, part of my role is to um, uh, oversee the systematic review, the, set, the, the technical work behind the PSA testing 
guideline review. So I'm going to very briefly run you through the process that we're following um, in this review over this period that uh, ensures that we are um, done according to the expected standards. And um, both uh, Jeff and Peter have alluded to the fact that we want to make sure this process is done well. This means that there are several steps that we've already been through a part of the process and so this this talks very much process orientated to uh, to assure you that we that we're following steps it'll mean that we come up with guidelines that are um, that are on on track and and make sense so up front we need to set the scope and that's been a lot of work that we're undertaking right at the moment um, as well as prioritizing the the issues and, and Peter's nicely set the scene for some of the issues that we know will be priority um, and we're getting um, confirmation of that through the, through the evidence and through the implementation and use of our expert advisory panel. Peter's talked a little bit about what's emerged in the last decade and, and a lot has in this area. And one of the other things that we do is scan and scope the international guidelines because we're not working in a, in a vacuum here while some of the processes that we, are, that we are following are really important to put an Australian context and an Australian lens around. Uh, there are other guidelines internationally that we are really interested in, um, as well as scanning the horizon. So looking what's around the corner, some of that might relate to the PSMA PET type of issues that uh, Peter touched on, uh, as well as um, different applications of, of MPMRI. And we, we see some studies that are coming out where that's being used at different stages of the process. So that's the, the, over, the, the overall uh, way in which we're going to, to take on these, this, this review, remembering that it's a review of guidelines and we're not starting from scratch. So the steering committee, you've met Jeff and you've met Peter, who are um, the co-chairs of the steering committee. We've got an excellent steering committee um, that is uh, representative of um, a number of the, the senior players in terms of, of cancer and prostate cancer uh, across the nation, as well as some um, uh, fantastic representation from consumers, um, general practitioners, urologists, radiation oncologists, epidemiologists and pathologists, as well as <clears throat> First Nations representatives. Our expert advisory panel also sits below our steering committee. Again, uh, lots of representation from people who were involved with the last review, um, people who are, who, are, who are new to it um, as well. So we've got some, some new blood in there. And most of the expert advisory panel are also members of what we're calling our working groups. So small working groups who've been assigned questions and recommendations from the last guidelines that are going to pursue um, the, the structure, the scope and the issues that we need to take on this time. So you can see the, the array of working groups that we've set up there from risk factors to decision port support to on PSA itself, because those are the issues that sit at the very center of of the review that we're doing. We've got one on digital rectal examination, um, MP MRI, which wasn't really covered in the last review, uh, in the last set of guidelines, but is so central again to this, to this set of updates. We've got prostate biopsy, active surveillance and watchful waiting. And in three groups that we're calling themed based groups, which touch on harm minimization and risk adaptation, our communications and education group, and a group around socioeconomic implications of guidelines. On the right-hand side, it's where I sit uh, with part of the Daffodil Centre. We've got a fantastic team uh, working who are specialists in systematic review, who've, uh, who've got experience with the, the previous prostate cancer guidelines, as well as other guidelines uh, across the board in the oncology setting. So uh, a good team to take this on. Very quick reference to some of the some of the standards and the methods that we want to adhere to. So the first point is that we uh, we we're, we're going to get these these endorsed as we did last time by the National Health and Medical Research Council. This ensures that they're done to a high standard and they're trustworthy, credible, and defendable. Uh, and it also ensures that they're based on the highest quality current e evidence. And the NHMRC require us to do a number of things that are signposted here. We've got a very clearly defined problem and an identified need. We've developed with the, the scope of the expert advisory panel and the steering committee, a multidisciplinary group, relevant experts, end users and consumers, and they have already declared their potential conflicts of interest. We've all got conflict of interest in, in some of these areas, but declaration of those is, is very clear. 
Um, and as I mentioned, our team are going to systematically identify and synthesize the best available scientific evidence. We do this through, through a number of processes and what we really like to see are high quality randomized control trials. We're not gonna find those on every issue and question, but we have some other means and mechanisms to, to work through getting some, some clear recommendations at the end stage. At the end, we need to have clear and action, actionable recommendations in plain English for health professionals. And we also need to ensure that they are, as we've identified, clearly articulated and communicated to um, the wider public uh, uh, as well. It's important to remember that there is, um, it's a bit like painting the painting the, the, the Sydney Harbour Bridge that whenever we start a review, new issues are gonna come through along the way. Uh, and the NHMRC also recognize that and, and, and indicate that um, we'll need to sort of go back and repaint some of the bridge as we go through this process. So the latest date um, of the publication period that we review is, is has, has to be within 12 months of the first date of public consultation. So the, the draft guidelines will be out for public consultation uh, once uh, once we've got them in draft stage, another important part of the, the NHMRC standards. And we also have them independently reviewed by a clinical expert team that ensures that we follow due process and our methods uh, are up to scratch. Very important at the end, uh, and we've recognised this and NHMRC recognised that we have to incorporate a plan for dissem dissemination and implementation. Um, right, uh, not going to go into great detail on this one, except to say that we've already undertaken a scoping review of international guidelines for PSA testing. In fact, we widened it and we found that there are over 100 references um, currently uh, around prostate cancer and prostate cancer related treatment. We narrowed these down somewhat, focusing just on PSA testing and have found uh, around uh, over 21 separate guidelines internationally published in the last 10 years since our Australian NHMRC endorsed guidelines were, uh, were, were covered. I've only just put a few on this page, but they give you a bit of a spectrum for the, the type of issues that are, that, are, that are talked about at the very centre of the guidelines. Um, and most guidelines now do have separate recommendations that talk about men at average risk of prostate cancer. And you recall Jeff talking about this. We've The, the recommendations, the current recommendations are around informed decision-making and then biennial just testing. If a man decides to be tested, uh, for, from the ages of 50 to, to 69. It's quite a lot of variation internationally uh, on, on age groups, for example, as, uh, as well as um, some ways to, to risk adapt those uh, and, and, and offer testing at different time periods over, the, over the, that, that period of time as well. So you'll see that the job isn't particularly easy because we don't have one set of international guidelines that we can go and call on, but we do have the ability to either adapt or adopt guidelines that we think have been well developed and are based on evidence and that might be apl applicable to the Australian setting. One of the other processes that we've completed is uh, some scoping and some priority setting and we used our expert advisory panel and um, steering committee experts to help us identify the recommendations and there were 21 recommendations from the 2016 guidelines those recommendations <clears throat> that were most in need of review. So we did this through a, a simple survey, uh, asking them to think about the way in which the recommendations currently reflected practice, <clears throat> technology, and, and the, the, the availability um, of evidence in these areas. What we found is that all of the recommendations and the questions need some sort of review, and that's no surprise because uh, because things have moved on as as uh, as Peter indicated. There tended to be a high level of ranking <clears throat> of items, so up to ninety six percent of our respondents said that um, the issues related to active surveillance and what to do with a negative truss biopsy need the recommendations need review. These are the areas where we've seen active surveillance moving on, as well as the the, the implementation of of MP MRI. Some of the issues that that were <clears throat> somewhat less less ranked. It doesn't mean to say that they're not important or that they don't need some sort of review, um, but these relate to such issues such as risk factors, 
digital directional examination and decision aids. Um, it might just be a, a lighter touch that we do in, in relation to those issues being reviewed. This has been useful for helping us set the scope and work on priorities. Our team can't take everything on all at one stage um, because of the, the rigor in which we have to do the system error reviews. We asked the committee to say, what else do the guidelines need to address? And we've been sort of calling this our laundry basket. Uh, no surprise, MPMRI was mentioned about 50% of the, in about 50% of the comments. So it, this is um, uh, this really has changed a lot of the practice that we've seen in the last in the last decade. And so our MPMRI working group, <clears throat> ably led by uh, Professor Jeremy Grummet, has has begun work already on defining what we need to um, understand in relation to MPMRI. We're also very much aware of risk adapted testing strategies <clears throat> that may include genomic markers, um, triage, stratification algorithms, and more individualized approaches. This is going to be a, I've got to say, this is going to be quite a complicated one for us to actually have the, the data from the evidence and the papers out there, but nonetheless, uh, an important area for one of our groups to work on. Peter's talked about transperineal biopsy, big changes in the last 10 years, and that's that's going to be reflected in the, in, in, in the review. Um, Age-related recommendations, <clears throat> as I mentioned with the international evidence, um, there's some questions about recommendations at both ends of, of the age spectrum, particularly as our population is aging uh, and aging well, that uh, potentially the upper age limit of uh, suggesting 69 may, may require some review. PSMA PET, again, some mention about that. It's one of the newer technologies. The, the general consensus, though we need to, to sort of define this, is that the evidence to date um, means that it must be, this may be a horizon scanning issue as, a, as opposed to one that's going to be central to the guidelines. And there was also discussion from our group around at-risk groups. So, And we are particularly aware that men in re regional and some rem remote parts of Australia still have much worse outcomes in relation to prostate cancer than uh, the men with, with, with greater accessibility, as do First Nations men uh, and men with a family history, history of prostate cancer. So these are, these, issue, these are issues for one of our working groups to deal with. The comments that we had from the group uh, also reflect many of those issues. And I put a few of these up because I think they really hit the, hit the nail on the head in relation to some of, the, some of the areas and issues that are important. So decisional support. Jeep, much of the decision is is rested back at the general practice end of things. And the comment on the top left is speaks to this very directly in sense saying for GPs, it's not feasible or gold standard, standard uh, to, to offer gold standard support. Uh, and so how, how are we going to um, uh, be able to, to deal with this, to flag the issue for men, to acknowledge that often it doesn't happen uh, and, and even less likely with GP shortages. The issue uh, around the weighing up between the harms and benefits of testing has been essentially the issue that has uh, has hampered more wide widespread adoption internationally of prostate cancer screening. Um, and there's an acknowledgement that a lot of the, the data behind that hasn't been drawn from Australian sources, but from uh, from US from the USA, particularly where over treatment um, um, the, the over treatment issues. Uh, are felt to be more more persuade, per, pervasive, um, and so this is a this is one of the questions or the, the, the approaches that's been talked about in terms of us thinking towards the future. PSA strategy, testing strategies is a is a really clear one that that uh, it's it's really hard to have a one size fits all approach. We know that um, that that's led uh, both to over detection, but also to men slipping through the gaps and, and having a threshold of three nanograms per milliliter um, uh, was always a bit contentious in the last one, uh, but but again, it was, was based upon, upon, upon evidence. Biopsy practice varies with the evidence of MPMRI, um, um, uh, but we'd like to think that our new guidelines will reflect this um, a more standardized approach to the way in which that's offered and undertaken. And lastly, digital rectal examination, the, the often stigmatized uh, uh, approach, not approach, but what men often think about in relation to prostate cancer comes down to uh, the, the DRE. It was covered in the last guidelines, but essentially uh, we're trying to educate the population that it's not just about DRE, it's also about PSA and about the other approaches that follow a PSA test as well. Um, um, 
the last guidelines indicated that DRE was not recommended in the general practitioner setting, but was uh, more appropriate for men with a raised PSA um, with uh, undertaken by urologists with, um, uh, as they say, more experienced fingers. I'm going to jump through the diagnostic pathway very quickly, except to say this is a very simplified schema for the way in which men are often uh, initially introduced to, to, to PSA or to prostate cancer testing, attending a GP, uh, and then being triaged depending upon how the PSA, uh, what the PSA level is, uh, and 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 what and what the follow up procedures are. I guess the point that I want to make about this is that is that PSA testing guidelines aren't just around whether to test or not to test, or who to test and when to test and how regular to test, but it's about the flow on effects of testing and following up from the test that as Peter so uh, eloquently described is it's not is not a diagnostic test for prostate for cancer, but it's a way in which to triage men further on. The color in this diagram reflects each of our working groups. And so while we've split the working groups up to essentially deal with different issues along the pathway, we recognize the importance of the crosstalk between those working groups to ensure that we have consistency throughout the the, the flow of the diagnostic pathway. But some of the other questions that we've, we've kind of, we've raised and we know that are gonna be important for the working groups as we progress along this, this process and the working groups have started to meet. Uh, essentially, what are the key papers? What's been published on the topic, particularly randomized control trials, because those are the ones where potentially the risk of bias is lower and we can be more certain. The problem with using randomized control trials is that they take a long time to mature uh, they can only cover very focused questions. And so often we have to fill in the gaps between the randomized control trials. We've already talked a little about the international guidelines, um, NH and MRC ensure that we've scoped the guidelines and should our recommendations come up with anything different, majorly different from international guidelines, they wanna know why. Um, we also need to know if there are any current or planned trials that would be practiced changing along the way. Uh, we also need to put in place a system where our guidelines can be dynamic uh, and can change in the future more, more consistently and more concurrently than potentially they have at this stage. Um, and then we also have this question of saying where evidence is not available, what else do we do? We have some tools at our fingertips we can create consensus-based guidelines, we can use modeling to ask specific questions using inputs from trials and elsewhere that we know and apply them to the population. And I'm kind of excited to say that we've got a, a model, a prostate cancer testing model that will be published in a couple of weeks that we've been developing at the Daffodil Center that has a huge potential to be adapted to answer some of the questions that we may have holes in from this guideline review. I think that's enough for me at this stage, Jeff. Um, um, gives you a brief overview of the process that we're going to follow. Uh, it also, I think, explains why it's 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 going to take a little bit of time. Um, guideline mm -hmm. reviews don't happen in a blink of an eye, and and this process is going to take um, what we will measure in 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 months and 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 oh, in, in 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 a year or two. So we haven't got a specific guideline or on the, or the a deadline, um, but but we need to be patient and work through these processes. Hey, thank you, David. And, you know, it was quite important we spent that time going through the process because we want to make sure that participants out there, those interested in the review, you know, are aware of the, of the depth and the rigour and the requirements associated with producing a set of guidelines down the track. And it will take some time. Rest assured, we're getting about this as quickly as possible. Uh, but we're making sure we do it in ways which are defendable, which are evidence-based, and, and which will stand the test of scrutiny. So, David, thank you for that. We do appreciate it. Well, what we might do now is move on to our next presentation where we look at the guideline review process through a, a psychosocial lens. And for this, let's hand over to Professor Suzanne Chambers. Suzanne? Thanks so much, Jeff, and I'm delighted to be here today and have the opportunity to talk to this audience. And may I say, as a, as a psychologist and someone who works in the care and support of men with prostate cancer and their families, I get a bit excited when I listen to Peter talk and David talk um, about these biomedical advances, 
because I can just see and understand what a difference this project is going to make to the psychological support and the survivorship support of men with prostate cancer. So it's it's very exciting indeed. Um, and I must say that uh, it's wonderful to be able to be part of this uh, panel because it represents um, the inclusion of a perspective of the whole man. Um, and his family, and then we're not just talking about his prostate, we're talking about him as a person and an individual. The diagnosis of a cancer, any cancer, is a major life stress for anyone who's having that experience and, of course, for their families. And there are some aspects of prostate cancer, I think, that, that make it quite unique. Um, one of those is that, of course, we're talking about men, and men tend not to be active um, health healthcare seekers. And, uh, and this can lead to barriers for us in providing support for them. Um, so it's very important that we're all on the same page about what care is needed and that everybody knows what's going on so we can um, meet men's needs as they work through this experience. When I say cancer is a major life stress, that's because it's a threat to life. It's a threat to lifestyle. It's a threat to relationships. It's a threat to the future. And these are all the things that weigh very heavily on someone when they're going through a diagnostic experience and wondering if they have a cancer and then ultimately if they end up with a diagnosis. And we know, for example, that one in five men, even with localised disease, will have clinically significant anxiety or depression and distress, and that can be very long-lasting for them. One of the things that can, can contribute to that distress are unmet informational needs, and I particularly think this is important in the lead-up process to a diagnosis. If there is confusion about the process, if a man feels that he has not um, been efficiently dealt with with the best possible evidence, those are factors that are going to contribute to his distress. And I'm sure many of you who are listening into this have, this webinar have had the experience where they've had a man come to them who's been diagnosed with advanced disease, who feels that he didn't get the opportunity to make that decision for himself about early detection and that he's missed his opportunity for cure. That's a devastating um, situation for any man to be in and we want to avoid that. And how do we set the best situation or the best context for avoiding that? We do that through having evidence-based clinical practice guidelines that everybody knows about, that patients in the community know about, wives know about, partners know about, families know about, and that general practice knows about so that uh, we can ensure that every man in our community gets the best possible experience. When a person is diagnosed with a prostate cancer, of course, what they want is the best chance of cure. And so they want to know that they've had the best information to guide their treatment. We want men to be empowered to be able to make their own decisions about their health, and they can't do that if they don't have access to evidence-based information. Again, the importance of this project of it being done in such a detailed and careful way about having all the right people involved and about knowing that we've got a commitment through our community and education committee about um, how we are going to uh, disseminate this information once the project is finished. So we want the community to be aware, we want men to be aware, we want men's health organisations to be aware and we want the GPs to be aware. I want to um, flip over now just to talk very briefly about the idea of survivorship. And this is something, the concept of survivorship has had increasing attention um, in Australia in recent years, although it's been around for decades, just perhaps hasn't had so much um, attention. And the idea of survivorship and or being a cancer survivor was actually coined by consumers wanting to Get, up, get health professionals, I guess, to see the bigger picture of the person, to see them as, as more than an illness, as someone who has a context, who has a background, who has a family and who has needs that perhaps our biomedical focus doesn't always pay attention to. The definition of who is a cancer survivor is a person, any person who has been diagnosed with a cancer for the course of their life. And so when we're talking about clinical practice guidelines for early detection of prostate cancer, what we must remember is at the moment that detection of a prostate cancer occurs, that person becomes a cancer survivor. The lead up to that process is really important, needs to be evidence-based and needs to be known for all. Now, there are many different survivorship guidelines around. 
Um, the one that I particularly want to reference here is one that was actually um, developed by the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia with leadership from Professor Jeff Dunn, who's here with us today. It was developed with a panel of academics, researchers, clinicians, and importantly, a big group of prostate cancer survivors who were able to meet with us and through a process that was iterative and went over, over some time, come up with a really robust framework of prostate cancer survivorship in Australia and New Zealand. So really important locally grounded work. Now there are six domains of importance to this survivorship framework, but the two that I want to draw attention to because I think they're so relevant to what we're talking about today a personal agency and shared management. Personal agency is at the center of the survivorship essentials framework. Um, if you wanna read about this, it's published open access in the British Journal of Urology International. So you'll be able to find it there. And what personal agency means is that we are patient-centered, we're person-centered, and we're making sure that our model of care um, is, is uh, led by that the, the individual's um, perceptions and needs. Having appropriate evidence-based guidelines for the journey that occurs up until the point of diagnosis is a really important point for promoting personal agency where we want the man, his family, and everyone in his care system to be aware of what's appropriate, what the evidence is for it, and what the outcomes are that a person can expect um, throughout this process. The other part of the survivorship um, domains that I wanna highlight is shared management. And that means that every decision as it goes through is shared between the consumer or the person with cancer or the cancer survivor and whoever is the care provider at that time. And they're making these decisions together. And this connects very much to the idea of shared decision-making where the patient is an equal partner in this relationship with the healthcare professional as they go through. So these are all things that are really important. And many of you who have, um, I can see who's in the audience here, know this information really well. But I think it's important to highlight that, that we're looking after the whole person. We're aware of the psychological burden of prostate cancer. We're aware of the survivorship burden. There are consequences for treatment. There are consequences for no treatment. We want men to be empowered, to have the information that they need to make decisions that lead them to manage their health in the way they best prefer. And we can't do that unless we have evidence-based guidelines that will guide us through the early detection process. So Jeff, I think that's as, as much as I really wanted to say, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Hey, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, and I, you know, reinforcing some very important aspects, you know, about the, once again, that psychosocial domain in relation to, you know, PSA testing uh, and the fact that it's about you know, individuals, men, uh, living in a context, living in a family, living in a community. Thank you for that. Let's let's turn our attention to our final uh, presentation speaker this morning, um, and it's it's Will, um, a young man, a prostate cancer survivor himself. Uh, Will, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, thanks everyone for listening in. I'll I'll crack into my story and diagnosis uh, pretty much straight away. But firstly, I do want to start by sharing my screen with, there you go. This is my first one. I love this. It's the society grows great when old men and women plant trees, the shade of which they know they will never sit in. Um, it's a Greek proverb, and but more recently, it comes from the Afterlife TV show by Ricky Gervais on Netflix, which a lot of cancer survivors will probably be very familiar with. Um, it resonates terrifically powerful for me when we talk about things like this and what we're trying to achieve, uh, not just for the near future, but for the long-term future and to set a better process in place. And I reckon we can be even better than the old men and women planting trees. We will be able to see the benefits of what we're working on and we'll be able to see it relatively quickly as well. Um, but I want to talk about something which, really honest, still the thing of, of all of this because I feel like it's too late for me to benefit from, from what we're talking about here today. Today I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I, I don't like to talk about. I very rarely do because I find them counterproductive mostly, but today perhaps they are particularly useful. Um, it's my what if and regret. Now I take all the blame for what happened to me. I don't want to lay blame on any way, shape or form on anyone else but myself. Um, 
I was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer in July 2020. Um, but I sometimes realise, or at least think, that I possibly didn't need to cop what was a incurable disease at the age of 42. I could have known better. It's my life. It's my health. But I didn't. Um, and this is the process that got me there. My first what if and regret. I was somewhere between 36 and 38 years old. Um, my GP ordered a, a long list uh, of a blood test, pretty much a full health checkup, everything from iron levels to HIV. And um, turns out that my PSA way back then was 1.4 in my mid to late 30s. I mean, I knew very little about the prostate. I knew very little about prostate cancer other than the, the silly misconception that it's something old men get. Um, I didn't think anything more of it, and no one else told me to think anything more of it um, until years later. My first appointment with my oncologist after my nasty diagnosis, he gone through my medical records, and 1.4 at that age, he says, should have been a red flag. It perhaps should have been followed up. So sitting there in that doctor's office in Adelaide's northeastern suburbs was the first time that I kind of got that thing and realised that perhaps this desperate fight to stay alive that I was now facing could have possibly been avoided. It's a lot to process. Um, my second what if and regret. In December 2019, my dad, 76 years old, uh, his PSA was worryingly on the rise. The biopsy comes back. He has a Gleason 9 prostate cancer. The first time in my entire family history, someone had cancer. Now, I went along with my dad and my mum, and I sat in the specialist office with them um, as the final nitty-gritty details of the surgery. My dad needs is explained and, and the effects of it. Um, I had no inclination whatsoever what my father's diagnosis meant for me. As a 42-year-old sitting there in that office, in a hospital, no one mentioned to me what my father's diagnosis could have the ramifications on my life. So, so I walk out pretty much just happy that, you know, Dad's going to lose his prostate, but everyone thinks he's going to be okay. And it was just over six months later when I was diagnosed that what I didn't know, what I wasn't told about the elevated risk of family history is crystallized. Now, my urologist, he zeroes in on my family history and male members of my family. Um, he says to me, tell your brother to go to the doctor today, like today, and get a PSA test. My brother's a bit older than me, so obviously a potential elevated risk for him. Once again, that horrible wave of what if and regret swept through me. Instead of having a possible early detection and the best case scenario and the complete cure, I ended up with the almost worst case scenario. Cancer in my bones, constant monitoring, a lot of nasty treatment, and then the dreaded lifelong androgen deprivation therapy. As I said, it's not fault or blame that I'm attributing here. I call it slipping through the cracks of early detection. Um, I don't like to focus on these what ifs and regrets, as I mentioned, because I can't change what happens to me. But what I want to try and change, and what I think we can change, is the fact that no one else could slip through the cracks um, of this early diagnosis. We need to have a PSA testing advice that is crystal clear to everyone everywhere. Um, just in the past week, uh, I do a lot of work with the PCFA in terms of awareness and things like that. Just in the past week, I've spoken to a GP who's a huge advocate of testing so that no man ever gets a diagnosis worse than stage one. He said to me, just get the people through the door and I'll take it from there. Which was great to hear someone hearing my message, knowing that that early awareness, uh, that early PSA testing, knowing your family history would be followed up there. On the flip side of that, in the past week, I spoke to a father of seven who went to the doctor at age 61 and faced some pretty severe pushback about getting a PSA test on the recommendation of another, another specialist. That PSA test led to his diagnosis. A pretty nasty diagnosis too. His 39-year-old son is now dealing with a similar issue. He's not sure when to get tested, but he went along to the doctor at last, and they weren't sure either. Now, 99% of the time, I deal with my cancer diagnosis 
and treatment with what I call a white, hot, raging, slightly annoying positivity. Um, and to be fair, I have one little but massive reason. Alfie. Alfie is my eight-month-old son. He's the reason I refuse to be beaten. He's the reason that I talk about prostate cancer awareness and research to anyone who will listen. He's the reason that three years after I got a cancer diagnosis, I did an Ironman triathlon. He's the reason that I can hear him speak in the back of the at the moment. It's so wonderful. Um, he's the reason that I have enduring hope for, for what we are doing. And hope is not some wishy-washy term. And perhaps I thought it was before I was facing such a, a, a serious diagnosis. Hope. I've learned is optimism with a plan. And I firmly believe that is what we have here. I have hope that he will grow in a world that will be different to the one that his dad lived in that meant he slipped, slipped through the cracks. He'll grow in a world that will be far, far different to the way we treat prostate cancer. But it will only happen with the work that we're doing here and, and a lot of work from, from other people in, in detection and treatment and and you know hopefully finding that that mystical uh treatment that is the cure no matter what diagnosis you get i have hope that what we're doing here will create a greater society for for men and their families no matter how old or young that man is we can really make a massive difference to the way we do things and if you take nothing else away from this, just remember that little boy's face <laughs> smiling up there and sitting there. He's my reason for hope. Find your find your reason for hope, please, because this is literally life-saving work. Thank you, everyone. Will McDonald, thank you. I mean, thank you very much for that very personal and powerful account. Um about your call to action or call to arms. Uh, for awareness and and I suppose also for for sharing with us about Alfie. Uh, I certainly feel uh, optimistic uh, with the plan after listening to you, and I thank you for that, Will. We appreciate your support very much. Look, uh, friends, we're on the hour. What what we will do, we started a little bit late. With your permission, we might just go out on a few minutes because there are some questions uh, which I will flick to the panellists. Let's take those. Panellists, if you could, in response, uh, uh, try and be brief. I know some of these things are not straightforward, but please do try to be brief, and I might just palm these around as we work through some of these. And apologies up front if we can't get to all of them, but we will we will take a couple and see how we go. First one now about will the new guidelines cover diagnostic pathways for suspected low PSA prostate cancers? Can I throw to you, Peter Heathcote? Oh, thanks, Jeff. Um, that's a, a really difficult question. At the end of the day, we have to answer these questions based on the literature. And if the literature doesn't answer it, uh, then we look at modelling and try and get a, get a best fit. And we talk about levels of evidence, quality of evidence. evidence. The, the issue with uh, low PSA prostate cancers is that it's not that common. There's not, a, there's not going to be strong epidemiologic evidence to support decisions. That doesn't mean we won't look at it, uh, but it means that the strength of our advice and the certainty with which we can uh, give that is diminished because mm. of the power of the observations. But uh, we're certainly, we're well aware of that that issue and and of course will touches on that uh, very poignantly in fact um the, you know we, we want to try and look at the risk groups and those younger men with with uh family history particularly and look at tailoring the, the psa levels for those those groups of men particularly here's peter thanks for that we've got a question there from uh, another peter down in South Australia down in Will's Way. David, I might ask you to have a run at this for us. Is it proposed that this guideline is a living guideline? It would be 
excellent if it was a living guideline. Having a living guideline obviously takes into account the horizon scanning and just what's around the corner. And, and so therefore we should be aiming for that. Having said that, that does require some commitment uh, and then with commitment comes funding uh, and the various other things that, that ensure that we've got um, a core group of people who are around and available and can spot these things on the horizon mm. and action them. So um, uh, that was the politician's answer to say our community, our, one of our groups needs to take that on um, because I think it's something we should be aspiring to. Yeah, and just to follow up, David, 100%, and our, you know, our view at the steering committee is that that needs to be a part of our final package to government about that ongoing surveillance to, to ensure that we capture new evidence as it comes along. The next two questions are actually directed to Suzanne Chambers, Look, what, what about a comment on decisional regret, uh, Suzanne? The other one about, you know, can the psychosocial care of men undergoing like diagnostic testing, you know, can that be included in training for those working uh, closely with men uh, with prostate cancer? Thanks, Jeff. I'll, I'll try and be brief. So if you look at the literature on decision regret, it varies considerably methodologically, in particular with regards to uh, measurement and sampling, and these dramatically affect the outcomes. Um, in my own research done many years ago, we actually found that decisional uh, conflict or distress after treatment for localised prostate cancer was actually predicted by optimism um, rather than anything else, which I think tells us the story that how what a man experiences is not just related to um, what he's got in front of him, it's about, it's about other factors. So I promote a holistic approach to psychological health with, with prostate cancer um, and have been fortunate to work very closely with the PCFA nurses over the last 18 months in this. And absolutely the work we're doing can be broadened out to address those, those particular issues. Um, what we want is a really core set of good skills in all of our health professionals, our allied health professionals and our nurses to deliver quality psychological care for men at every stage of the journey. Mm, here, here. Look, thank you, Suzanne. Uh, I noticed there there's a, a couple of comments uh, about you, Will, thanking you for your contribution. And once again, here, here to that, it was tremendous. So I must say thank you again. Uh, there's a question there about, you know, the UICC and will the outcome uh, of the review in Australia, you know, lead the world in effective management. Do you know what? We want to make sure we're at the cutting edge of all the evidence, you know, of, of the best possible guidelines. David, in his presentation, spoke about some variety globally about what's going on. Uh, so we'll make sure that when our guidelines are finished, uh, we share them internationally and we look to make sure that Australia is indeed, you know, uh, leading a global effort. We certainly are at the top of the pile when it comes to our clinical outcomes. And, you know, Peter Heathcote can talk about that. Our five-year survival rates are amongst the best in the world. Um, we want to make sure that we're at the front of the pack, certainly when it comes to our, uh, our, our testing guidelines as well. Look, ladies and gentlemen, what I, what I think we must do uh, is, is wrap up. I know we set aside an hour. Uh, what I want to do is just quickly uh, wrap up uh, and then encourage you uh, to remain engaged. So first up, uh, a thank you to all of our panellists, um, each and every one of you um, are closely involved with the work of the PCFA and are closely involved with the work of this uh, review. Uh, and I think participants can see the quality of the and the calibre of the contributions that we're going to be having. So thank you to you. Can I just reinforce for everyone out there that that this is a rigorous process. Uh, and in the end, it's going to be the evidence which decides what the recommendations are. It, it needs to be that way for reasons that Peter and David and Suzanne and Will have all stated. We need this to be defendable and we need to make sure that it is uh, rigorous and up-to-date so that each and every one of us uh, sing from the same song sheet that there's uniform acceptance of these guidelines. They are uniformly applied across our country. And we make sure that we get into that very important business of raising awareness so that each of us know what the guidelines are. Each of us have got clear guidance on how we can look out for our own health and what choices we can make. And then each of us can ensure that we start to control 
you know, prostate cancer in this country more effectively. The focus on rigor and evidence is a laser sharp focus uh, from the steering committee and from the review. And I assure you that we will keep that top of mind. And I remind you uh, that we have information packs. Some of you will have had them. Uh, they are quite substantial. Uh, they do uh, include much of the information you've heard today uh, and as also links elsewhere. Information packs will be available uh, from the PCFA website and will be mailed out. Uh, I also remind you that a copy of this webinar uh, will be included uh, on the PCFA website. So please take the opportunity to go there, have a look at the pack, uh, have a look at the webinar, pass that on, certainly make it known to your colleagues, and of course, learn a little bit more about what PCFA and our stakeholders and colleagues are up to as well. Uh, can I also acknowledge with great appreciation uh, sponsors for this webinar, Astellas and AstraZeneca, uh, industry friends in this regard. Uh, thank you for your support. It's terrific that we've been able to pull this webinar together to try and update and brief those who have an interest uh, in what we're up to uh, in ensuring that we control prostate cancer uh, as best we can in this country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, with those few comments, uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, if you have questions, queries, or want further information, please do visit you know, PCFA dot org dot au with very best wishes signing off <laughs>